Welcome to our virtual education event. Some of you may already know me. My name is Aurelis Cortez. I'm the event coordinator at Turning Point. We are so happy that you guys are here. Today we're going to be discussing what does it mean to be healthy by our um, registered dietitian, Lisa. And for those of you that do not know about Turning Point, um, Turning Point Breast Cancer Rehabilitation is a uh, 501c3 nonprofit. We help the breast cancer community. Um, even though there is no charge for these educational events, um, we succeed because we have donations. So if you guys want to donate, just go um, to our website, myturningpoint.org, and you can make um, a donation there. So we appreciate your time today, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Lisa. Welcome everybody. Um, I'm hoping I, we have some, this is my third Zoom lecture and I'm hoping we have some repeat offenders here. Um, today we're going to talk about, it sounds so easy, but what does it mean to, to eat healthy? Um, I get this question a lot and if I had a live audience, I would throw it back at you guys and ask you, what do you think it means to eat healthy? Because everybody has a different perception or perspective of what healthy eating is. There's a lot of people that have a lot of rules and guidelines and you must do this, you must do that. And I think we get overcomplicated and overstressed about healthy eating. Um, so we're just gonna be straight into the point, very, very basic. We're gonna start at the basic level. Lectures later, we can go into more depth about like vegetarian eating or vegan eating or plant-based diet. But right now we're gonna go over everything. Why this is not advancing. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So all the information that I take, especially um, in our cancer world, is the information I get is from the American Institute for Cancer Research. Um, they have, they um, combine forces with the World Cancer Research Fund, and they came up with this food, nutrition, and physical activity um, prevention of cancer guidelines. It's this beautiful book. It's it's this thick, um, but we're going to hit the, the, the topic, the, the, the main points of this. So Getting started, I know a lot of people feel that when they get started that they have to go from their poor eating habits to 100% perfect and beautiful and, and all cohesive. Um, and, and that really is, is a setup for failure a lot of the times because of just based on what our diets were prior to. You know, if we had had different eating or poor eating habits or not eating as healthfully as, as we should have been, and then expecting ourselves to go to wean off of all of our junk and then to eat healthy, our healthy plate, um, some people get really discouraged. They feel, they feel deprived, they feel neglected, well not neglected, but deprived mostly of, of those things that, those demon foods, like, oh, I can never eat that donut, or oh my gosh, I will never eat another cupcake or a cookie. Um, and they, they, they label their foods as kind of good foods, bad foods. But um, years ago with my association, uh, monthly we have a, it's, it's a National Nutrition Month, and my favorite slogan was, all foods can fit. And that's exactly what we should think of. All foods can fit into a healthful eating. So we're gonna get started. So research sets, what, what, was, what does our research want us to do in the cancer world? In the cancer world, we, fiber is key. That's like the first one, the first up to bat. We need to get fiber. People don't even think about eating healthfully and adding that fiber um, a lot of the times. We, no one ever mentions that. They're like fruits and vegetables, but nobody ever says, oh my goodness, I should have 30 grams of fiber every day. So fiber is one that will keep us healthy. healthy. Um, one, it will keep our colons healthy. One, a you know, fiber works in multiple ways. You know, we have two types of fiber. We have soluble and insoluble fiber. Insoluble fiber does not absorb liquid. Insoluble fiber is your bulk uropage, and that sort of stimulates your gut to move. And so that insoluble fiber is the one that really helps keep our gut healthy and keeps um, colon cancer at bay. So increased fiber is important. Soluble fiber is one that absorbs liquid. And so it becomes more, um, more viscous. It becomes more like, I, I, I equate it, and I generally have two baby food jars here. My insoluble fiber, I have like wood shavings from, you know, if you saw wood. And then my other one is actually the inside of a, of a, of a diaper, believe it or not. That's what the soluble fiber, it absorbs liquid just like the diaper would. It's a perfect example. So those two are important. We need to have a bigger ratio of the insoluble fiber, the bulk and the roughage, and then a lower percentage of the soluble. So um, 
So those are the things about fiber and where do we find fiber? And these next two points are where we're gonna find it. You know, we, we do need to increase our fruits and vegetables. Everybody, pretty much everybody in, in the country, I would say, needs to increase fruits and vegetables on a daily basis. We used to say, you know, five to nine servings or, or five to seven, I mean, giving servings and now we're putting them in cups, like three and a half cups to five cups of vegetables each day. And if we think about that, you know, we have three meals a day and if we even did the minimum of 3.5 cups, that would be a cup at every single meal. It's completely doable. So five might seem daunting, but five again is very completely doable once we see the, the, the guidelines from what, what the American Institute of Cancer Research says. Um, incorporating more whole grains into your diet is always important. And we're gonna talk about those in, in just a minute, okay? So we talk about vegetables. We know that they're important. Um, I mean, I think everybody understands that fruits and vegetables are important for us. Um, they, provide, they provide a multitude of uh, not, uh, cancer fighters, you know, the phytochemicals. Um, phytochemicals are what give your fruits and your vegetables that beautiful color. You know, like right now, there's so many things that are in season. We've got, I love watermelon. The peaches are in season. We have melons, they just like cantaloupe, honeydew. All those things are beautiful, all different colors. And the more color that you provide or the more variety of color means that you're going to get the variety of those phytonutrients, meaning you're going to get more of a, of a, of a protector. Phytonutrients are cancer fighters. They help prevent and help keep us from cancer, but also heart disease. And with breast cancer and breast cancer survivorship, I mean, heart disease is something that we always have to think and always have to remember about because that, that is something that, that you're at increased risk of just for being diagnosed with, with breast cancer and survivorship. Then with vegetables, we always say choose fresh or frozen. We always want fresh or frozen. Sometimes, um, you know, frozen is actually a better option than, than fresh is, so depending on where you're at in the country or where, you know, if, I, if you live in a rural location, I sort of live out in the boonies, and, you know, my grocery store does have fresh fruit and, and vegetables, but I don't know from the time that it was well, it was it was harvested at the time that it got to my Publix and how long did it sit at Publix and then how long did it sit on the shelf before it got to me. So in the winter time, I, I, I focus more and I rely more on frozen because frozen vegetables are flash frozen. They go from, they go from the, the, the farm, they're washed, and they're flash frozen. So sometimes they can have actually more nu nutrition, more nutrients um, than, than your fresh, depending on where you are. Okay. Um, I do have clients and they always ask me because I do have a, a whole gamut of, 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 of clientele. And so sometimes they're like, well, all I can afford is, is canned. And if that's the case, the guideline is we just have to watch sodium. We just need to get things that have no sodium added, um, no salt, no sodium, and, and go from there. They're not completely nutritionally void. Um, they are the lowest, but they still provide us with some nutrition. So we can't completely rule that out, especially for my clients that that's what we rely on. Um, all right, and we need to, we, I said, eat a variety of the color. A serving is as simple as a half a cup cooked vegetables, or we can have one cup of raw vegetables. Very easy, very easy to incorporate three and a half to five cups in a day, in my mind. Okay, your fruits, um, same thing. We need to choose fresh or frozen. You know, if you choose canned in, in the in the winter time, I'm okay with cups. I'm I'm great with that. Um, I'm okay with that. Um, but what we what do you want to do is you don't want to have those that are in heavy syrup. Um, and I don't like you to do the sugar free ones. I have ones that say they say have no added or sugar free or no added sugar. Um, and those are the ones that generally have a sweetener in them. They'll have Splenda. Um, I think that the, the, it alters the taste of, of the fruit. You're fine to just to get one that's in its natural juices or actually in the, not even the light syrup, the natural juices. So those are fine to get. Those are great to have on hand. I always have the little tiny fruit cups on hand just in case I don't have anything fresh or frozen. And that does happen at my house. Um, so with these two, we need to get a variety of color. The color, again, we said the color will depict so get reds and purples and, and white. You know, people are afraid of white foods. It makes me laugh, but what is white? We have bananas that are white. We have cauliflower that's white. We have onions that are white. Those things are huge in the amount of phytonutrients that they have. Um, with fruit, <clears throat> now fruit is more calorically dense than vegetables are. Um, in a serving, a serving is about one small piece of fruit. So say an apple would be one of such of like uh, a little bit small, about a tennis ball. So if we can hold it in our hand, that is a, like this, that is a, a, sm a small serving of fruit, whether it be an apple, 
whether it be a peach, uh, a pear, you know, you've got all these different fruits on here. Um, or you can do a cup of melons or berries chopped up, a cup of that, or again, a half cup of a can. Um, and that's like the little fruit cups already come measured out, they're a half cup. So with those, they are more calorically dense. So if we are watching our calories or watching our weight, you know, yes, it's important to eat fruits and vegetables, but we don't want to get all five cups coming from just fruit. Just because if we look at, you know, a, a serving of fruit is 60 calories, a serving of vegetable is 25 or less. It can be less if there's nothing added to them. So if we're trying to save calories and still eat healthfully, we can have a serving of fruit. We're just not going to eat all of our servings as fruit. So 60 as opposed to 25, and you can save a lot of calories. Um, that, that way if we're, we're monitoring. Um, one thing I don't, I'm not a big proponent of juices or juicing for that matter. You know, a six ounce glass of, of juice or really four ounce, you know, six ounces, but four to six ounces is a serving and it's calorically dense. It has about 60 or 80 calories and has zero fiber because most of the time those juicers just juice and this should give you the, um, the juice and takes, takes out, spits out all the pulp and all the fiber. Um, that's okay if we have people with gastroparesis or people that can't handle the fiber, and there are some people out here that can't, but for the most part, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not a proponent of eating just, or drinking juice, okay? Um, just because we're missing out a lot of the fiber, the extra benefits of the fiber. Okay, whole grains, I mean, I think we throw that down, um, we say that all the time, well, what is a whole grain, what does that mean? Your oats are a whole grain, you know, brown rice is a whole grain, quinoa, you have, you have frica, you have um, millet, all of those are whole grains, whole, whole wheat breads, whole wheat pastas, those type of things that we're talking about. When we're talking about the whole grains, um, the, the, we're talking about, it, it includes the germ and the bran. Um, that is the whole whole grain. When we have like things like white bread and um, you know white crackers and stuff, that strips that strips the bran and the germ away, and so it's just it's just the wheat without all that. And the most of the nutrient dense high fiber is in the germ and the bran. So we want you to get more of these whole grains, um, whole foods in you as, as much as you can. Um, it says that you should eat at least three ounces or three servings of them a day. And a serving is as simple as like a half a cup of um, oatmeal, a half a cup of brown rice, it says here a half a cup of um, whole wheat pasta, you know, a half a cup of quinoa, those types of things are, are, that's one serving. A slice of regular, like a whole grain, a good hearty whole grain bread is also considered a serving. So if we think about it, we should be eating three meals a day. Um, and at each one of those meals, if we have a whole grain, we're good as gold. Okay, um, I'm not saying that we can never eat anything white. Um, that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is that we should incorporate more whole grains in with it. Um, I'll be completely honest. I, I'm not a big fan of, of, of whole wheat pasta. I'd rather have white pasta. But if I'm going to do a plain white pasta, I'm going to make the rest of what comes with it um, great. So I'm going to have tons of vegetables, a big huge salad. Um, I might have, if I have, if I choose to have bread or anything with it, I'll choose a whole grain bread with it instead of just having the white French bread with, with a bunch of butter and margarine on it or garlic bread. Um, all right. So then dried beans, we, we generally don't think about these or include these. A lot of times people put these or don't even think about these being in, in, in that category of being healthy or healthy eating. But Dried beans and legumes are also referred as, as pulses. You might see that in a recipe, um, but that's like your lentils. You'll see that on the, the screen, lentils and split peas, hint of black beans, white navy beans, um, black eyed peas, chowder beans, like all of them. Um, and those, what they do, they provide us with, with protein. And we're gonna talk a little bit about our pro, what we should be eating as far as the um, protein um, requirements or actually, um, the meat specifically. So these types of, of legumes and stuff are a great source. They're a great source of protein, but also they're going to give you that fiber that we wanted you to get fiber, you know, 30 grams. So that's going to benefit with that. Um, and they give you good quality carbohydrates. And, and carbohydrates, I know that there, you know, there was a, the push and everybody is so afraid of carbohydrates and, you know, the keto diet and everyone needs to, to watch the carbs. But in reality, 50% of what we're taking 
than our day. 50% of our calorie consumption should come from a carbohydrate source. And this is one of them. All right, so these can be substituted. You know, you, you've got great recipes for, um, for, um, for uh, black bean burgers. And there's great recipes for, for um, you can take them and you can do like the, make hummus, garbanzo beans. So there, there's a, a plethora of ways that we can pull those in. So I, I would love for people to do them on a daily basis. And if you could, um, they, they, they're, they're excellent for you. You know, if you have issues with, with IBS or with gas, particularly legumes are known for producing gas, but um, there are, there's a product out there called Beano uh, and you just actually add that and it will break down um, the gas for you. So you don't have to worry about being too gassy post, um, post um, consumption of the, of the legumes. If you are an IBSer, that's a whole nother, whole nother category and we probably should eliminate those from our, when we do a FODMAP elimination diet. Well, we, should, we do. So that's a whole different topic. Um, and a serving is a half cup, as simple as a half cup. And that's doable. You know, I, I, you, tell, you can do a huge salad and you can add any of these legumes to a salad. A half cup is nothing. You know, garbanzo beans are, are one of the things I love to put on a salad, but it, you can put any of them just to give them the flavor and, and some extra protein and your carbohydrates. Lisa, I think okay. someone has a question. Oh, oh great. Should I go back? Um, let me see what the question is. Um, Betty, did you have a question? I saw your hand up. Yes, I was not able to get online. I couldn't hear, but I'm finally hearing everybody. Uh, everything's going well now. Thank you. You're oh, okay. okay. Okay, thanks, Betty. Thank you for joining us. Okay. Here we go. All right, so the American Institute for Cancer Research has a new, we call the New American Plate. And this emphasis, this emphasis obviously is on reducing your cancer risk and other chronic diseases. So we remember, remember the old plate that we had that is cut in half and then we have half of that should be vegetables and then we should have a part of it should be our carbohydrates or our, our whole grains and then we have a fourth being protein. Our new model now is to have two thirds of a, um, uh, well two thirds, one third model, okay, all right. So cover at least two thirds of your plate with plant foods. So your whole grain, your vegetables, your fruit, and your beans. So I, I encourage you to know what the guidelines of having 3.5 to five cups of fruits and vegetables. We know that we can have one, if not two servings of fruits or vegetables with each meal. That'll even put us over the top. So we have that filling our plate. And then we have our, our whole grain. So what would we choose as a whole grain? I mean, we can, we can do any of those, anything. I would choose, I mean, fruits and vegetables, all, quinoa, if you've not tried it, it goes wonderful with vegetables. It can, you can do a million different things with it. And then, you know, if you did a bean, I mean, you can do a black bean or a black IP with that as well. And so that's two thirds of our plate. Um, and then we go, and then we have the last third, it's with our lean, lean proteins. Seafood, we can count on poultry, you can, you can use. Um, low fat dairy foods can actually count as your protein as well. Um, they, they are a great source. We say low fat just because we watch saturated fat and we're gonna talk about that in a minute. And occasionally red meat, and I will, we're gonna address that very shortly. So that's as simple, that is, that is what we need to do to eat. That's, that's, I could end the lecture now and if we follow those guidelines, we'd be good as gold. But we need to be a little bit mindful of some things. Um, so we know all the positives. I just gave you that real brief summary. It's that easy. Get a plate out, draw two thirds on it, fill it up with all your fruits and vegetables, preferably as fresh as you can um, with unadulterated. And I'll tell you what I mean by that in a minute. But um, we have to be mindful of the following things. One, saturated fat, butter, okay? So when I say unadulterated vegetable, that's what I mean. I don't, I don't want you to take that beautiful head of broccoli or all those gorgeous Brussels sprouts and douse them in butter, okay? More butter does not mean more better. It might taste better, I understand that, but it's not better for our, our bodies. Saturated fat um, is one, it's an inflammatory fat. Well, let me, let me go back. So saturated fat is found in butter, it's found in margarine, palm kernel oil. It's found in baked goods. It's found in chocolate, um, coconut. Everyone's talking about, you know, that was a big craze a little bit ago, all this coconut oil and how great it is for us. Um, and that turned out to be um, a, um, a little bit of a flop. Um, so there are still saturated fats. 
all of them are saturated fat. Saturated fat is inflammatory. Inflammation at any part of our body is not good. So chronic inflammation at the cellular level is not, is not a healthy thing. Um, our cells do not like to be bombarded and abused by, by the inflammation that we put our bodies through. So one way we can get rid of, you know, one thing is, is watch the amount of saturated fat that we take in. Saturated fat is always, we've always focused on this in, in, the, in the cardiac world. You know, I've always monitored and had people monitor what their intake is. So watching that is important. And if we look at a label, a food label, the food label does have uh, saturated fat on there. So we would just pay attention to that. And the least amount of saturated fat that you get, the better off that you're going to be. Our body requires zero saturated fat. Um, it does require fat to help circulate your fat or absorb your fat soluble vitamins, which is A, D, E, and K. Um, so we need fat, we need healthy fat, we need anti-inflammatory fats, but we don't need saturated fat. So the label is, is, is a plethora of information and on there you will see, it'll say total fat and underneath that category, you're gonna have a subcategory of saturated fats and trans fat. So when you're doing comparative shopping, because people always ask me, all right, Lisa, like all my career, butter or margarine, butter or margarine, butter or margarine. And then like, we'll get the label. First, it's, it's taste preference, but we can do a comparative um, uh, with looking at the labels. You know, you, you do, you have your butter. I usually say if we're gonna do butter, do whipped butter. Uh, it's 50% air you're paying for, but you know, why not? So with butter, I love the flavor of real butter as opposed to margarines. And if you look, you're not really saving a whole lot of saturated fat if we go from uh, whipped butter to some margarines, because the margarines are just as high in the saturated fat, and that's what we are trying to eliminate. I generally, if I meet with, with anybody, any client, we talk about that. We talk about saturated fats. I calculate budgets. I, I calculate everything, and like your budget is 13 grams or 15 grams or 20 grams in a day, depending on your calorie range. And then that is your budget. Doesn't mean you have to meet that budget, but that's your budget. And that's what we look for on the food label. So when we're comparing two, two products, the one, one thing that I always look for is which one has the least amount of saturated fat. Because generally a saturated fat budget is not 50 or 60 like our total fat budget is. It's on the upwards of you know 15 or less, depending on the calories. So we're gonna watch that. We're gonna be mindful of that. Look at that on every single food label that you pick up, please. Um, alcohol, I get this question all the time. And you know, about 10 years ago, um, the, the guidelines were different than what they are now. And the guidelines even say a small amount, even a small amount increases your cancer risk. So for cancer prevention, um, they, it's best not to drink any alcohol at all. For those of you that were in survivorship, um, th this is something you need to really talk um, with your physicians about. We have some physicians that are a little more, more relaxed with that um, and some that are more strict. So I, I recommend that you talk to them. There's is a final say. They know what you've gone through. They know your medical history. So that is what we need to do is talk to them. But always be mindful of that. Okay, so sugar and cancer risk. Okay, sugar does not cause cancer at all. It doesn't, never has, and I don't believe it ever will. But what sugar is, it's a non-nutritive form of energy. Energy is your calories. Um, if we have wasted calories, which that's spelled wrong, I just noticed. Um, wasted calories, um, but actually it can go to your waist, but excess calories um, can put an excess weight on, um, you know, it's just empty calories. So, you know, if you're more apt to, to, to be eating all your calories in the form of food and then go out and have a piece of cake, that's gonna put you over your budget, which that's gonna result in weight, it can result in weight gain. So that extra cal, those extra weight, and especially around the middle, put us at increased risk of cancers. And, and, and basically, breast cancer, uterine cancer, um, stomach, um, colon, esophageal, put it a little bit higher risk. Um, the guideline for this from the American Institute for Cancer Research, they do put a guideline on it, and they say, you no know, more than six teaspoons of added sugar in a day. Um, might seem like a lot, um, but it's really not. That's two tablespoons. But on the food label, I don't know if, if anyone is at home, if they can go grab a new food label. I, don't, I thought I had mine right here, but it's not. Give me a second. But the new food labels will show you how much added sugar is in a food product. 
Um, our labels previously did not give us this information. They just said um, sugar. Um, the sugar will be under the subtitle carbohydrates. And so it used to just clump all sugars together. Now we have sugar in other forms. We have sugar that comes in fruit called fructose. We have sugar that comes in our milk that's called lactose. So a food label before was not very helpful as far as added sugars because if you look at a, a glass of skim milk, <clears throat> any of the milks actually, it says there's 12 grams of carbohydrates and 12 grams of sugar. And I would have people completely freak out by that. That And I had to explain that's not added sugar. That sugar comes in that milk. And that is something we don't have to monitor. We're not watching lactose. We're not watching fructose. Because what comes with that lactose in that milk is calcium, it's vitamin D. So what comes with that fruit, um, fructose and fruit are fiber, um, phytonutrients we talked about, vitamin C, potassium, all those different things. So we, we are watching only the added sugar. And what is added sugar is what we see on the screen here. That's one form. But on the label, what we consider added sugar now is anything that is added to a product to alter its flavor. So it is, it is sugar. It is maple syrup. It is honey. It is concentrated fruit drink because they will do that all the time. Even though it's a fruit drink and it's concentrated, it's still added sugar. So underneath that subcategory of carbohydrates, you're going to see how many grams of fiber, and that's what we looked for earlier. We know our guideline was 30. And then underneath that, it's going to say total sugar, so many grams. And underneath that, it's going to say so many grams of added sugar. And I neglected to put a conversion factor. I'm going to show you. I'm just going to tell you how to convert. Um, <clears throat> when you have grams of sugar on your food label, so we're going to look at added sugar. And say you have 10 grams of added sugar on your food label. You're going to take that number to 10, and you're going to divide it by 4 because there are four grams in every teaspoon. So 10 divided by four is 2.5. And that is how many teaspoons of sugar would be in that product. So it makes sense if that product is a cupcake, like, okay, I can get those 2.5 teaspoons. But if that product is, is, is your, I don't know, uh, fettuccine, or not, it won't be fettuccine Alfredo, or, or shrimp scan, I don't know, we're just, I'm, I don't know what, a, uh, 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 oh, or it'd be like a Chinese food, like a sweet and sour chicken, let's just say that. Um, there you go. Th then that's not okay. I mean, we, I would rather save my budget, personally, for something that is yummy, and rather than just waste it on that. So a lot of the things that you wouldn't even assume that there's added sugar in, you'll, you'll see it on the food label now. For instance, you know, you can find in potato chips. It's in ketchup. Um, it, it can be in, as simple as, like I said, some of those, some of those like teriyaki chicken, teriyaki um, 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 seasonings, like you can do marinades. All that stuff is going to have a lot of added sugar. So that's what we are looking at. You know, you can say, I don't, I don't add sugar to anything, and that is a huge accomplishment. But I need you to look at the label because you're not adding it, but but your government, or the, I should say government, the food, your, your food companies are adding it, the marketers. So look at that for yourself, and that's going to help tremendously, and that'll save calories as well in the long run. Okay? Lisa? Red meat and, yes? <laughs> you knew... Uh, you knew you were not going to pass the alcohol without any questions. Okay. All right. There we go. Don't shoot the messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. <laughs> <laughs> so just, just a, a quick um, question, comment. Um, so recapping, no alcohol? That's the comment. <laughs> okay. So from the American Institute for Cancer Research, their guidelines are no alcohol for cancer prevention. All right, I wanna say something about all this stuff. There's not one food or one thing that causes cancer or one food or one food item that can prevent everything. So all I'm gonna say is that we have to have a level, be mindful about it, and we have to think of our overall eating plan, the whole, the whole diet, the whole entire diet, okay? And we need to talk to the doctor. I don't know what everybody's on or where, who, you know, if there's what types of cancer, but you can talk to your, your physician about that. Um, I think it's a hard, you know, this is something that's changed. Before we used to say one drink a day, we're okay. And now it's like none. And, I, and, and I'll be honest, I like to have a glass of wine. I'll be honest. So um, 
you know, I, I sort of weigh that one bad thing with like, I run a little bit every morning, you know, so, and other things. So it's just a balancing act with that one. But again, with medications, we always should check. Or if we are uh, undergoing chemotherapy, radiation, we always need to talk to our physician because there's other things that can go on with that. So I'm okay, sorry, don't question. shoot the messenger. I'm just giving you the information. Another yes. um, question. Um, so what about cooking um, with alcohol, like chicken and wine sauce? Does that count towards the no alcohol? That is an excellent question. Um, generally, I, I, that does not go in. I don't put that in that category just for the fact is, you know, even if you make something that has a half a cup of, of alcohol in it, the alcohol burns off when we, if we, if we burn it off. But the, the portion size of that, unless it is small. So you, if you're making um, a chick, say chicken, I make tarragon chicken and I put white wine in it, that tarragon chicken meal feeds my whole family, which a family of five. So the, the, the amount of that is so minute and, and most of it gets burned off. It's the flavor of it then. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Well, that was an excellent question. All right, we good with that? And I can skip over this one? Oh, I made it. Okay, all right. So um, meats and processed meats, red meats. So our red meat, you know, it does provide a lot of, it does provide protein. It provides a lot of, 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 of minerals. It, it provides a lot, but red meat can also, a high red meat consumption can increase your risk of cancer. So we do not encourage a lot of red meat consumption. And so the, the guideline is no more than 18 ounces of red meat per week. That's the whole entire week. So if you're a red meat connoisseur and you like it, um, you know, three ounces a day at the end of the week, by, by actually by the end of the sixth day, you've met, met your budget. A lot of my female clients don't, well, they really don't eat a lot of red meat, but that's a guideline. You know, if you have a, if you have a, a, a filet every once in a while, that's wonderful. And we're not going to wrap that filet in bacon because that's our next topic. Um, Processed meats are, are one that they really want you not to even consume if we can. That's like the alcohol. The least amount of processed meats, the better. And again, you have to use your mindfulness with this. You know, if you have a turkey sandwich once in a blue moon, it, it's not going to be the end of everything. Um, but if we have bacon every day on our, on our, I don't know, with our breakfast, um, that wouldn't be, uh, that wouldn't be re really recommended. And, and even those, we have to be careful of those that even say they're nitrate and nitrite free you know they are they don't have that that sodium nitrate in them the chemical but they might have things like um, celery extract or celery concentrate and celery has naturally growing that nitrates in them so not to say we shouldn't eat celery because the quantity that you would have to consume to be troublesome is large um, but, but we don't know right now when we're taking out that sodium nitrate and putting in these concentrated forms of the celery, um, what that's going to play out. So in another 10 years, we might be like, stop everything. Like, don't do that. And we're going to do this now. Um, cause it takes a good 10 years in the cancer world for, for things to start showing up, uh, uh, the result of what we're doing to, to start showing up in the cancer. Okay. Salt is another good, another one. Um, you know, people think that, you know, I don't have hypertension. I'm good. I don't need to watch the sodium. I get that. I get that a lot, but sodium is sodium chloride. It's, it's salt, you know, on your food label. It's going to be on your food label. It's going to show you that beautiful salt. Um, the new guidelines from the American, um, American Heart Association are that we really um, should keep our sodium intake to 1500 milligrams a day. They put that in a clump of, of people like that are over 55, that are, that are increased risk, that are African-American, they're listing all these. But why just single out that? And why say, okay, I don't fit that category, so I'm good as gold. I would rather people start learning to be sodium conscious now in their, in their 30s and 40s and before like their hypertension sets in and then they're like, oh my goodness, now what do I do? So we can even prevent the hypertension, though sodium does not cause hypertension, it has a role in it, but we can actually do that. We can, if we're more mindful with salt, um, 1500 milligrams is not a lot. So on a food label, that's another thing that we should all look at. Um, you know, you can shoot it in, you know, a, a, a can of, of soup, you know, we all know that, that that's bad, but a can of soup can have three times the amount that we need. 
to 4,000 milligrams sometimes. So we've really got to be caught, conscious of that. Anytime that we can get anything that is lower sodium or sodium free, that, that's a great thing to do. Okay. We can use in place of it, you can use fresh draw or, or fresh or dried herbs and spices. Um, anything, anytime you get a dried herb or, or, you know, like for instance, well, this is not an herb, but um, lemon pepper. I had, I had one patient one time and took out the sodium and used lemon pepper and everything. And her, she was still having problems and so I, she brought her lemon pepper and we looked at it and sodium was the first ingredient on her lemon pepper so just be mindful of that you know we know that if it's dried basil and dried tarragon it's pretty much that but if you get all these these like um these seasonings like uh this is our our uh, steak seasoning our chicken seasoning we need to look at that because most of the time most of the time salt is the first key ingredient so you're safe with like Mrs. Dash, Papa Dash, Mama Dash, all those dashes. You're fine with those because those are all herb-based. But And you can always make your own. You can Google it. You can make your own. But just watch out like that first ingredient on a lot of those things, especially marinades and seasonings are going to have salt in them. Okay. Um, and then I want to cautious those that using salt substitutes. Um, you know, so salt substitutes can be, they're made with um, potassium chloride instead of sodium chloride. And if we have any kind of heart issues or sensitive to potassium, that could throw you into a, a big flux that can throw you into a lot of trouble. So at, I'd always talk to the doctor, say something to the doctor, you know, is it okay for me to use a salt substitute? And they would give you the yay or nay. So salt substitutes to be, be aware of, be cautious. Okay. All right. So what we have now, um, if you guys go on to um, the American Institute for Cancer Research, it's about mouthful, they have a new a new, um, well, it's not new, that's been out several years, but it's called the New American Plate Challenge. And it's a 12-week interactive program, and it's led by a group of dietitians. And it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty awesome. And because they take you, they don't expect you to go from point A to point B in overnight. And, and nobody should. Um, nobody should put that pressure on themselves. But it's a, great, it's a great wealth of information because they take you slowly. Okay, because small changes go a long way. So it's like, I'll go back with the sodium. I don't expect somebody to be on this regular diet and then go, go to zero sodium or very low sodium because you're gonna be mad and everything's gonna taste awful. Um, but it's like if you've ever gone to the hospital, you know, when I used to work in the hospital, I go see patients, they're like, this food is terrible, like I hate it. And the reason for it is we have no salt on it. And so we're not used to it. So it doesn't have flavor. So it's going to take a little bit of time to, to get that out of your system. But small changes will go a, a long way. So what they do, this is just an example. So say this is, you know, on the far left, that's what, you know, your diet is or what we're eating. Okay. And that's what we have. We have mashed potatoes and butter and we have green peas and we have that, that steak, a pretty large steak. I'd probably say that's five, maybe six ounces of a steak. Um, and then you go to the middle. This is the middle line. And so they're still, now they're switching the potatoes with rice and they're putting a little herb flavoring on it. And then they're doing more green beans and then a smaller portion of that steak. And then the final, you know, final episode or, or the finish line would be substituting the red meat with, with the, that's chicken right there. They are getting brown rice. That's brown rice instead of white rice. And they're doing a, a different variety of and color of vegetables. And it is that completely innocent and simple to do it that way. Very easy. Um, and let's see. Okay, I think, that, oh my gosh, I, I'm done. <laughs> Wait, hold on, all right, yeah. I, I guess with that one, the, the, the take home message is doesn't have to be hard or complicated. It just has to be, we just have to be mindful. That's my favorite guy. Can I go back to him? Because I liked him, he blew my mind. I like it. Just be mindful, just think. Okay. Any questions? Let me. Um, I'm getting back to there. We go. I think. Eric, let me just unmute everyone. If anybody has any questions, um, now is the time to ask. I have a question. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. Um, what about sea salt as opposed to regular salt? Okay. Very reason, I don't swell as much when I use sea salt. And what's, what's the difference? Is there any help at all? 
Um, there, there is no health benefit from it. Sea salt, um, it's still a sodium. Okay. But with sea salt, you, you know, you can buy a different grains with salt. So you can buy very fine sea salt or very coarse sea salt. I say to have the gamut of all the different ones because you can take a quarter of a teaspoon of the very fine sea salt and after you're cooking and you could spread that a long way. Whereas the more coarse is only going to be, it's more concentrated. So if you have something very small, like a baked potato, you just want to put a little bit on, the coarse salt is fine. But if you want to spread it over the whole meal or whole dish, it'd be the, it'd be the finer. Um, there's no health benefit. It's still sodium. You still watch. It's going to, it's sodium ratio is a little bit lower, <coughs> excuse me, lower on that than it is on like a teaspoon per teaspoon basis. So you might be using the quantity wise looks the same, but sodium content is a little bit less. So maybe that's what you're discovering. Well, thank yeah. you. I didn't know that you could buy the different grains of it. Oh so. yeah. You can buy, oh yeah. Very ultra fine. You can get real super fine. And oh, then the really coarse sea salt. Mm -hmm. Thank you. You're welcome. We have a few more questions on the okay. chat. Okay. Um, can you recommend sweet treats besides fruit for someone with a sweet tooth? Yeah. Uh, like, I would say, all right, plain and simple. It is, a, it's, it's a learning process, all right? I, I don't, I, I, how I teach people is that I, don't tell them to, you will never eat a cupcake again, or you will never do that again, because it's so, we have to sort of train ourselves. It's, it's becoming more mindful, but it's becoming, having discipline. So I will use myself as an example, because years ago, before I knew better, you know, I remember my mom used to make the best chocolate chip cookies in the whole wide world, like the best. And she made them one day, this before I, and, and I said, I want chocolate chip cookie. I want it. And I'm like, no, no, you're not having chocolate chip cookie. Too many, you know, and so I, so instead of chocolate chip cookie, I'm like, oh, I'll have a little bit of cereal. So I went and had a little bit of cereal, I ate that. I still want a chocolate chip cookie. And I'm like, no. So then I ate them graham crackers and I still wasn't satisfied. And you want to know at the end of that day, I ate the chocolate chip cookie. So in that, in that example of myself, I not only ate the chocolate chip cookie, I ate all that other stuff, all those other calories. And if I would have just had that chocolate chip cookie, get it done and be over with I would have saved a lot of calories, all right? We have that budget of added sugar. So that is okay. Like if we have like this, if we go over one day, it's not the end of the world. If we have zero in a day, it's not the end of the world. I generally say if we want something, like if I am craving like a, a cupcake, because that is my favorite thing on a day, if it's today, I want a cupcake, I will eat a cupcake. If it was yesterday and you brought me a dozen cupcakes and I really didn't want a cupcake, I promise you I wouldn't have eaten a cupcake. I would have saved it until I really wanted it. Now, if you're craving something sweet every single day and you're like, if you're asking like, what should we do? It's smaller portions of everything. You know, if you like a cupcake, instead of getting a cupcake, get a mini cupcake and do that instead. Or if you're going to eat one, I always say when we eat things, we have to, we have to use our whole surface area in our mouth. So whether that be chocolate, a piece of chocolate a day, or your, your cupcake or a brownie, you cut as many pieces as you can, but each bite should be in your mouth and you need to savor it. It should touch every surface area of your tongue and it'll, it, will, it will stimulate all of the taste buds. And then it will make your brain feel like you're, it's being more satisfied because it's in there longer rather than choo-choo swallow and then choo-choo swallow, not even getting that. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to fool our brain that it's in there. So I don't ever tell anyone, unless that's all you're eating all day long, it's sweets and sugar, um, I don't ever tell them to do that. And, and fruit is a great alternative, but it, it's not going to do the trick if you're craving a cupcake and you're eating a strawberry. Put your strawberry on your cupcake and just eat part of your cupcake. <laughs> that's, how, that's my recommendation. I'm sorry. That's how I, I look at it. Okay. What about um, well, I mean, a question? Not, yes. A, a question on meats. What meats are classified as red meat? Oh my gosh, excellent. I didn't even touch that. I'm sorry. Um, red meats are anything that doesn't cluck or swim. So we have beef, and we have pork, and we have lamb. We have veal, venison, oxtail, all that. So anything, I, so if we, what, what is not red meat? That's what we should ask. Fish, seafood, chicken, turkey. Those are the things that are not red meat. Excellent question. I meant to cover that. Thank you for doing that. 
Okay, we have another thought. Um, just to clarify, uncured meats are still classified as processed meats? Yes, absolutely they are. Uh -huh. Excellent question. We have to be right. cautious of them. We can be mindful, we have to be cautious of those. They still have some form. And, um, I had somebody that uh, it was a meat, that worked in the meat packer, and, and, and he said, Lisa, if they did not have nitrates in them, nobody would eat any meat ever because the color, it holds the color and it holds the shape. It's, they just would not be a, 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 anything that appealing. That's the, that's the word. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, do you have any additional tips for managing IBSD on a cancer-focused diet? Um, she says, I can take cit citrus cell to add fiber and, and often have beans and legumes, but have to go easy on many fruits and some vegetables. Um, with, with that, I would, I would, I would recommend um, a, a private consult with that one. That, um, that's a big thing. FOD mapping is huge, but um, yeah, FOD mapping is really the best way. If you've not looked into that, I would look into FOD mapping and it's an elimination diet to find out what your triggers are. Um, I work a lot in the, in the GI world as well. FOD mapping is one of my favorites in the GI world, but so FOD mapping, yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, and then just a compliment, excellent presentation, clear, concise, most of all doable. Okay, Barry, that's the key. I'm so glad that was it. I'm, <laughs> I'm really happy with that one because it, it is doable. It doesn't have to be overcomplicated. Okay. Anybody have any questions? Any other questions before we sign off? I think everybody's unmuted or you can unmute yourself if you choose to do, ask. Um, dairy, somebody's just at saying dairy, question mark dairy. Um, oh, as far as should, I don't know, that's a... So do you mean, um, Tiffany? Do we mean, do we have dairy or not dairy? I'm not sure. Um, okay. um dairy, dairy uh, in this realm of, with where the information that I, when I, where I get oh. it from. She's saying, should we have it or not and how much? When okay. It comes to dairy. Dairy is is a safe food. Um, with the American Institute for Cancer Research, we can go on there. It's a safe food. Um, what we look at with that, it's not really a, a guideline as to how much, but what we choose as far as um, they should all be like your your milk should be should be um, fat free, um, your yogurt should be fat free, and that's just simply because we're watching that saturated fat. The one that I told you is inflammatory. So all these whole milks, um, whole milk yogurts and that type of stuff, I, I shun people away from them. And just for the fact is the saturated fat content. Um, and any time that, you know, cheese is a great way to add some protein to things without having red meat. Um, but cheese, the two downfalls, it has more salt and sodium in it and it has saturated fat. So anytime that we, we can get uh, a, a, a cheese that has, is lower in saturated fat, like a light, lighter cheese, not fat free because that stuff doesn't melt and it has higher sodium, but a reduced fat cheese is fine. So you're going to save a gram or two of saturated fat when you do that. Um, but all the rest should be, should be like a fat free one. Be fat free. Thank you. Okay. I hope that I'll answer that. I have a question. Yes. Go ahead. Is it daily meat sandwich is a processed food? Yes. Are, are you doing like a turkey or roast beef or are you going to like Publix getting it or, or say you're going to, to Subway or not sure. Yes, they are. Oh. Any kind of deli meat is, is considered processed meat. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you. You're welcome. And, you know, if we do that, I, I sometimes will recommend, you know, we can make, a, I know if we all have the time in the world, but we can make a whole chicken or whole turkey at home. And then slice it up and have make your own sandwiches instead of going to the deli and getting all the processed. Cool. I know if we all had the time. <laughs> yeah. That's what Sundays are for. Isn't that what Sundays are for? Prepping all our food for the week. Oh, this is a good question. What about pack tuna? <gasps> Excellent question. Pack tuna is safe. That's perfect. Yes. 
I would, you know, just watch the sodium on that because it will have sodium because it's just, it's, it's canned. But that's the pack tuna is something in water. That's a, I should clarify that we should keep, you know, we don't, we're not going to have everyday tuna. Um, we should maybe can have that three days a week. Um, but that's a great protein to have on hand. You can throw that on a salad. You can throw it on a pita. You can throw it, you know, I mean, with cold pasta salad, I used to make that, you know, when I was in college. Um, and it's very economical. Yeah, that's a, that's a great protein to have. Well, I think that's it. Um, okay. Thank you, Lisa. This was okay, really, welcome, really guys. informative. Some days, well, yes, yeah, perfect. Thank you, um, everyone for attending. So we'll, we'll stay tuned. Lisa is going to do um, more of our educational events. Um, thank you guys for joining us. Thank you for your questions and making it engaging and fun. Um, we will post this, like I said, on our YouTube channel and our Facebook channel. If anybody does want to have a private consult with Lisa, please just um, send us a message, staff at myturningpoint.org, and we can arrange that. Um, and just as a reminder, we're here to help you through your recovery of breast cancer, if that's what you're dealing with. Um, Turning Point is here for the community. Please reach out to us. And if you appreciated today's um, complimentary program, please feel free to make a donation of any amount. You could go to myturningpoint.org. We would appreciate that very much. So we will post this shortly. Thank you guys for your time. And thank you so much, Lisa. You're welcome. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 <laughs> Bye.